Hello and welcome to Vanguard Audiobooks, The Learning College. I'm Alex Linder and you can find this and everything we record at vnnforum.com and permanently archived as well at alexlinder.com. We've been doing the Camp of the Saints. We've done two sessions. This will be number three. We're going to do page 52 up through page 78, chapters 13 through 17. So let's get going. Chapter 13. At the mouth of the Ganges, the Delta's reddened waters paled abruptly as they emptied into the vast Gulf of Bengal, and the hundred ships of the refugees of the refugee fleet steered a sluggish southwesterly course toward the Straits of Ceylon. The captains had agreed to limp feebly along for the sake of one moribund vessel, the shoddiest of the lot, a big river tugboat used to far calmer waters, the most pitiful cripple in this whole floating slum. And these are all boats on their last legs as they need to make it to Europe, and they gathered all the wealth of the extreme poor to pay the captains to just get us to Europe. That's paradise, then we're done, or the boats are done. Like the rest of her flat deck, her low-slung bow was piled white with pilgrims. With every wave it plunged into the water, paying the sea a ransom of surplus souls, carried off in the mists. A kind of pathetic hop-o'-my-thumb, struggling to keep pace and estrewing a store of human pebbles over a path of no return. On the lead ship, the India Star, the captain's fancy cap had changed heads and sat perched now on a bald, shapeless stump. Gold braid wreathed the monster's brow. The polished visor shaded his frozen gaze from the ocean sun as he stood on board commanding the ship and indeed the whole fleet. He was like some oracle, consulted before any weighty decision, dispensing his orders. So long as someone could read the flash and flicker of his lidless eyes, in time it became quite clear that, more than once, the fleet owed much to those silent commands. This is the monster with the deformed kid on his head. The giant with the uh, uh, <laughs> living ball of flesh made of stumps. Sort of a mud ball representative and symbolic of the entire mass of human garbage that's making its way to the truly human lands. Some of the actors in the drama were soon to learn how superfluous they were. From the moment the India Star blew her very first blast, in fact, and it came as something of a shock. Ostracized, victims of racial hate or simple indifference, especially indifference, they found themselves prisoners unpenned, yet hemmed in by walls of human flesh deep in the mazes below decks, or stuck in some dark stifling cubbyhole next to the engines. Forgotten outsiders, like captives won in battle, destined now only for the last triumphal march. A few helpless Chinese, and even some whites, squatting on their haunches, huddling together like primitive tribes, alone and hungry, talking and talking for a week on end. The event they had shared in, and the event they were forced to sit idly by and watch, plunged them deep into raptures of reasoned delight, heightened no doubt by fatigue, and filled with each one's concept of a bright new world, like something from the glossy pages of any leftist weekly in the West. Experts one and all among themselves, always on the verge, despite their woeful state, of taking self-indulgent credit for their harangues, like satisfied signers of innocuous petitions, ready to bandy back and forth their names, their ideals, their principles, things that mean terribly little, really, when someone is wallowing down in a ship's dark hold. With no food to sink their teeth into, they chewed the West to shreds with words. Hunger was turning them mean. Already they saw it their mission to guide the flock's first steps on Western soil. One would empty out all our hospital beds, so that cholera-ridden and leprous wretches could sprawl between their clean white sheets. Another would cram our brightest, cheeriest nurseries full of monster children. Another would preach unlimited sex in the name of the one single race of the future. A simple matter, he added, since unlike skins attract, which was something he claimed to know all about. Still another would turn our supermarkets over to the barefoot, swarthy horde. Can't you see it now? 
Hundreds of thousands of women and children smashing their way through those gigantic stores, stuffing their mouths with food, beside themselves with pleasure. Now and then one of these viperous tongues stopped wagging long enough to lick a few droplets of moisture condensed on the sheet iron wall. Nothing to drink, poor devils, cried the renegade rider. Well, decadent world, get ready to share your treasure. Your tubs will be filled to the brim, and the water boy, poor crooked neck bugger, will splash around to his heart's content, and maybe he'll even go out of his mind just thinking how heavy it would be, hanging buckets from a stick across his shoulders. And you know what? You'll have to knock at your door, your very own door, to beg for a glass of water. So saying, he collapsed, not to be heard from again. By the ninth day, they had all stopped talking, one by one. Militants with a cause, lay missionaries, apostate priests, idealist quacks, activist thinkers, the whole brigade of anti-world thugs that had set sail with the fleet. Somehow they managed to keep alive. From time to time a child brought them rice, prompted more than likely by the memory of Balin and his pocket full of sticky sweets. It was only when the fleet sailed into the Straits of Ceylon, around the tip of India, and then northwest toward the Red Sea and Suez, that the whole world sat up all at once and began to take notice. From that point on, words flowed and flowed from every thoughtful mouth, streaming over radio, coursing over television, and flooding in a swelling tide of print. Chapter 14 In a communique from Paris, this is a quote, received just moments ago, the French government confirms the earlier announcement that a state of emergency has been declared in the four departments bordering the coast and that reinforcements are being deployed to the south. It has also been confirmed that the President of the Republic will address the French people at midnight tonight, Paris time, with a message of grave concern. The Soviet government has decided to make public the statements contained in that message as soon as they have all been reviewed by the Central Committee of the Party, presently meeting in Moscow, in extraordinary plenary session. Quote, Ah, Zakharov! I see myself now, hero of the Soviet Union, from grenadier cadet at Stalingrad to general in the artillery, commander of the northern bank of this blasted Amur. And all of a sudden, a year before I am supposed to retire, they're going to turn me into a butcher of women and children. Well, all we can do now is figure out how much vodka we'll need to make those Chinese look as if they have uniforms. Then we can shoot them without a second thought. What do you see? What's happening over there? Colonel Zakharov replied without turning his head. Through the peephole in the command post bunker, he had his sights trained across the river, watching the Chinese swarming in silence since morning along the Amur's southern bank. River. We're going to have our hands full, General. We knew what to expect, but it's still pretty hard to believe. So many of them, squatting on the ground, lined up in rows as far as the eye can see, like a giant collective, with Chinamen sprouting everywhere you look. On the right, the babies. In the middle, the women. On the left, the young ones. And behind them all, the men. From here, if you count them in squares, like cabbage, I'd say there are two or three million. From a plain, maybe five. And still they keep coming. Are they just going to pile up in the river, or do you think they can swim? Ah, they're like dogs, these Chinese, the general answered. They know how to swim from the minute they're born. Listen, Zakharov, don't stop watching. You've got to be my eyes. I can't bear to look. I never could pull the trigger when an animal looked me in the face. Anyway, don't waste your pity. Don't be fooled by these sweet little tots, these clean-cut girls and boys, these helpless-looking women. You can bet when we shoot up that crowd, each one we kill will find just the right dramatic pose before they fall in a heap. Anything to impress us. With that faraway look in their eyes that they do so well. And the wounded ones will writhe at our feet like no other wounded bastard you ever saw. Twenty lessons to learn the whole act with group drills and practice sessions and special instructors in make-believe. They all love that. And the ones that put on the biggest show, the ones that seem to be hurting the most, maybe won't have a scratch. You won't know who's wounded and who isn't. A real Chinese opera. You'll see how much fun it's going to be. What are they up to now, Zakharov? Nothing's moving over there. No talking, no singing, no laughing, no nothing. I haven't seen one of them take a bite to eat all day or even move their jaws. 
You know, there's one thing that puzzles me. Do they pee while that? Tell a Chinaman don't, and he won't eat or drink or piss or screw or think. Give me the vodka, Zakharov. Those characters are beginning to get me down. I, I think I'll put them all in the Chinese army. I can see something else, General. Every hundred yards or so, trucks with loudspeakers on top aimed this way. Of course. And in each one there's a damn little Chinaman who speaks Russian and thinks he's a star of some second-rate play. A few words from him and we're all going to burst into tears. Proletarian comrades of the great Soviet Union, the time has come to return to the Chinese people in a spirit of brotherly love, these Siberian lands so long a part of their sacred ancestral home. Our women, our children, our peasants stand before you, helpless and unprotected. Your brothers and sisters, here to open your eyes, to show you the truth and reclaim what is theirs. Please don't shoot. We're unarmed. We're just poor, humble folks trying to make our way. And blah, 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 and more of the same. Well, I'll tell you, you have to watch out when you talk about poor, humble folk to other poor, humble folk who haven't heard anything else but poor, humble folk for some 60-odd years. You might just take in a few, don't you know? Then all of a sudden we'll be sitting by the Urals across from an unarmed army of pathetic old men, all ten years old, and yellow peons squatting out on their haunches. Give me my bottle, Zakharov. I've got to get uniforms on them all and stripes. I'm not worried about you, said the colonel. I know you can do it, just like in Berlin when your vodka turned that crowd of young fräuleins into an SS company of panzer grenadiers. I remember... But here you have 200,000 men, General. If the order comes down to shoot, what will you do? Will you get them all drunk, all 200,000? It wouldn't be the first time. The armies of Peter the Great weren't sober for a second. The sailors on board the Potemkin were terrible drunkards. Stalin himself used to dictate his finest maneuvers while he rolled around under the table each night. Yes, I've given it some thought, my friend, but the drunk soldier has no prestige any more. Not in this world of ours, mucked up with brotherly love the way it is. Or the soldier, period. We're caught in the clutches of the great hermaphrodite, Zakharov. We're all at serfs. We can't even cut its balls off. Sir, the Colonel queried, I'm not sure I... World conscience, illiterate prole. World conscience. Imagine how shocked it would be at a piece of news like this. Drunk Russian army slaughters five million unarmed peasants, women, and children. Anyway, if the French decide to shoot, that mob over there will take the hint and stay where they are, but frankly, I don't think the French can do it. They've always been the fair-haired boys of something or other, of the church, of logic, of love, of revolution, and now that blasted hermaphrodite, the deers. So it's going to be up to us. We'll have to be the ones to shoot. Thank heaven our garden-variety mujik, that's a peasant, is still the same good-natured oaf he's always been. Both feet on the ground, head screwed on straight. You see, being slaves to tradition isn't all, be all that bad. By the time I show up, the hunt will be over. They'll have bagged themselves five or six thousand Chinese, maybe more. Unfortunately, on an empty stomach, even a mujik gets tired of splashing around in blood. M-U-Z-H-I-K. The general closed his eyes and rubbed his lids, as if he were trying to shake off a weariness, heavy and deep. Zakharov, he said in a strangely different voice, tell me again what you see over there. Are there really women and children? Women with breasts, with long, slender necks and delicate wrists, with pants that hug their bellies and outline their sex? And children, too, with those great big eyes, so serious-looking the way only children can be? You know what I mean, don't you, Zakharov? You know how serious children can be when they make up their minds and play it for all it's worth. Oh, there are women and children, all right. And the way they look from here, General, you're going to need plenty of vodka, just like Berlin. All at once a voice boomed over from the southern bank, the metallic voice of the damn little Chinaman star of the second-rate play, mouthing the opening lines of his great part. Proletarian comrades of the great Soviet Union! What did I tell you, the General smirked. Time was we would soften up the enemy with a few rounds of fire. Today they just pound you to hell with their bullshit. The world has had enough of us, Zakharov. I think it's time we quit. The roaring voice rolled across the river from one bank to the other. 
You see here before you are women, our children, our peasants, helpless and unprotected, your brothers and sisters, here to open your eyes, to show you the truth. Soon we'll start to cross the river. Please don't shoot. We have no arms. We're just poor, humble folk trying to make our way. What time is it, Zakharov? 3.10, General. Then it's ten past midnight in Paris. That means their president has just finished his speech, and Peking has made up its mind. They'll be at it like this for the rest of the day, and all through the night, until morning. Call the field marshal, Zakharov. Ask him for permission to shut up those loudspeakers once and for all. Permission denied, said the colonel, setting the general's red phone back in his desk. Not a drop of blood, except on specific orders from the Kremlin, he added with a laugh. And you think that's funny? Can't you see that those windbags in Moscow have decided not to act, but to keep on arguing back and forth in the name of a bunch of principles they think it's their sacred duty to protect? We're caught in a crossfire word, Zakharov. That's no good for a soldier. It spoils his final bow. Now, I'm laughing at something else, he said, General. He told me to tell you that no blood doesn't mean no vodka. Ah, him too. He must wonder, he sighed, he must wonder what in hell he was doing in China when the first war was over. You should have known him then, a rabble-rousing cutthroat if there ever was one. Well, choke down your regrets, old friend. Come dawn, we'll all be plastered. He shook his fist. Three sensible drunks at your service, Mother Russia. Come, Zakharov, let's drink. Close up that peephole. I don't want to have to hear that loudmouth. Sounds like a priest. He's getting on my nerves. Now that every last padre has his pen or his mic, you can't even hear yourself drink anymore. Yes, it's padre time, Zakharov. That's what it is. All over the world, they're oozing out of every country. Thousands of everyday priests, ready and willing to poison the minds of millions of idiots. Bleeding hearts, puking out gospels galore. Ready, Zakharov? Forward march. One, two, one, two. Two, one, two, keep in step, head up, eyes front, stare vacant, head empty. Amen. If you don't mind, General, I'll pour myself a drink first. I can see we're in for a good long night. Chapter 15 To claim that the news of the fleet's departure caused any great alarm in the Western world, when it first became known, would be plainly untrue, which is doubtless why there was no end of clever folk willing from the start to spread endless layers of verbal cream, spurting thick and unctuous from the udders of their minds. The obliging bovines of contemporary Western thought, tails all a-quiver, acquiesced with delight to the daily milking, especially since, for the moment, there was no cause to think that a serious problem was actually at hand. To appreciate the West's opinion of the refugee fleet, or for that matter of anything new and unfamiliar, one essential fact must be borne in mind. It really couldn't give less of a damn. Incredible, but true. The more it discovers about such things, the more fathomless its ignorance, feeble its interest, and vulgar its own self-concern. The more crass and tasteless, too, its sporadic outbursts, fewer and farther between. Oh yes, to be sure, it indulges in flights of sentiment now and again, but cinema style, like watching a film or sitting in front of the TV screen, poised for the serial's weekly installment. Always those spur-of-the-moment emotions or second-hand feelings, pandered by middlemen. Real-world drama served up in the comfort of home by that whore called mass media only stirs up the void where Western opinion has long been submerged. Someone drools at a current event and mistakes his drivel for meaningful thought. Still, let's not be too quick to spit our scorn its way. Empty drivel indeed, but it shows nonetheless how reading the papers or watching the news can provoke at least the appearance of thinking. Like Pavlov's dog, whose slobber revealed the mechanics of instinct. Opinion shakes up its sloth, nothing more. Does anyone really believe that the average Western man, coming home from his office or factory job, faced with the world's great upheavals, can eke out much more than a moment's pause in the monumental boredom of his daily routine? Even worker power, that saving grace of our society today, is nothing but a parlor game, and played in a parlor too shabby and worn to stand up to more serious frolics. Risk a few, and the floor will cave in and go crashing to bits. The moon, Biafra, a murderous earthquake... A campaign against pollution, 
a six-day war, a bay of pigs, the death of a mow, mere Christmas parties, one and all, with the great thoughtless void suddenly wreathed in flowers and tooting its two-penny whistle. For a little while no one is bored, which is something at least. Quite a bit, in fact, if only it would last. But life isn't always Sunday, and we can't have famine in Pakistan or war in Israel every day of the week. Thank heaven, by the way, for the Israelis, those entertainers of the Western world. No danger of getting bored as long as they're on stage. Our jokers can all go to bed and rest easy. When they wake up the next morning, their café à late will be steaming brisk and fresh to the boom of Israeli guns. But give a damn? Never. What for? And so when the first news helicopter flew low over the fleet off Ceylon and got a worldwide scoop with a series of staggering pictures, what do you suppose our western joker thought? That his life was in danger? That time had just started his countdown to death? Not a bit. All he thought was that now, as the fleet limped along on its hopeless course, strewing corpses in its wake, he would finally be able to watch a first-rate serial, week after week. Detached from reality. But now let's imagine a rude awakening, a plunge into reality, with everyone caught in the soup, like nothing since World War II. The serial suddenly breaks through the screen, smashing it to pieces in the steak and fries, and all at once the hordes of characters stream into the living room, looking the way they did in the fishbowl, doing their tricks a few moments before, only now they're not acting, and the glass wall is shattered, and they're armed with their woes, their wounds, their groans, their grievance, their hate. Their machine guns, too. Now they rip through the apartment, jar it out of its orderly calm, st stun the families caught short in mid-digestion, spread through the town, the country, the world. Pictures come to life. Living, breathing problems on the march. News film actors turning on their director in unbridled frenzy, suddenly telling him shit to his face. Now our poor little friend sees only too well that he should have paid closer attention. He read it all wrong. He heard it all wrong. The story this time wasn't published and aired for his leisurely private delight. In fact, what he's going to hear now is this. Quote, A million refugees from the banks of the Ganges set to invade France in the morning. Five more fleets on the way from Africa, India, and Asia. Then a run off to lay in supplies to stock up on sugar and oil and sausage and noodles. And he'll stick a sock full of gold coins under a board in the floor. He'll go to his local garage and lick his lordship's greasy boots for two jerry cans full, set aside for the periodic evacuation. Then, eyes moist with manly tenderness, he'll look at his wife, his daughter, his aged mother, and see them already haloed in the nasty aura of self-sacrifice. After which, having belched up the last gaseous echo of the last sumptuous banquet of the veterans of gourmet dining, he'll declare himself, quote, ready to confront the situation, unquote. With a look on his face somewhat changed, a little more sly and resigned, prepared to sell out if need be. But things haven't gone quite that far for our little friend yet. For the moment, with millions of others, he's dozing off, ready to drown in the drivel, ears peacefully cocked toward his mind master's tinkling bells. What a concert, what talent, all solidly classic, steeped in the noblest tradition of the music of brotherly love. With maestros too numerous to name, loosing a flood of notes those first few days, a torrent of heavenly voices, angelic enough to make you weep. But still, let's try. We'll get tired of reading about them in no time, much sooner than they themselves get tired of their broadsides and speeches. But we mustn't forget the weight of the blame they bear. They took our poor little friend and twisted him around their finger. Not many on purpose, to be sure. But the minions who fawned on the monster, though few, knew what they were doing. And they did their job well. The rest of them spewed out their words and their ink for other irksome reasons, most common of which a certain aversion to violence, like the beast on the edge of his lush, fragrant forest, threatened with attack, but suddenly loathed to growl or bear his fangs when the merest snarl would be more than enough to protect him. Try to figure it out. Then, too, there was more than a goodly dose of moral misgivings, or cowardice, if you will, in the spreading contagion of their spineless pronouncements. Like the fear of not sneering in tune with the other hyenas, of not weeping in time with the Pharisee chorus, of not bleeding with the fools, of unwittingly proving that you can think for yourself, 
or the fear above all that the world conscience would point its accusing finger and single you out as the spoil sport troubling their treasonous revels. Oh, what fine scribblers and spouters we had back then in those early days of borrowed calm before the storm. One name on the roll of honor has to stand out above the rest. The unspeakable Jean Aurel, O-R-E-L-L-E, official spokesman of the French Republic. It was he whose babblings broke the silence, in charge, as he was, of starting the auction off. Everyone hoped he would set the bidding high, and he did. Eternal France, in keeping with the time-honored custom, owed it to herself to stand up, solo, and squeal out sublime and noble notes of love, with no thought of how she would get off the hook once the die had been cast. And that concludes chapter 15. Chapter 16. Without meaning to exaggerate the seriousness of the situation, the minister began, placing a slim sheaf of documents in front of the microphones. Dot, dot, dot. The ministers had, in fact, seemed rather nonplussed by the whole affair. What if they get all the way to Europe and decide to land in France? Asked one. Never make it, replied an admiral. I've taken a look at the pictures. One good stiff wind. That's all there is to it. Just like that. A million wretches drowning on the ground floor of the Elysse Palace, while the breeze gently rustles the trees in the park outside, clothed in their tender young green. In other words, the president observed, with his usual festive postprandial smile, we can sit back and just let the storm gods take over. Old Elis and Neptune, if I'm not mistaken. Someone cleared his throat, trying to come up with a simple idea. Why not ask all the governments on the Indian subcontinent to stop them while they still have time? A snicker from the other end of the table. Is there any such animal? Asked some undersecretary or other, one who usually never opened his mouth. A government on the Indian subcontinent. Sighs from the distinguished seats. I can give you the answer right now, said the Minister of Foreign Affairs. The governments of the Indian subcontinent, gravely concerned with domestic conditions and the worsening crisis in food distribution, dot, dot, dot. Another snicker. Balls, explained the undersecretary of this or that. Now, the president is hardly one to frown on after-dinner banner. Still, he finds the expletive somewhat out of order. Please, he says sharply, a little decorum. This is a serious matter. Then, turning to foreign affairs, you were saying... Another sigh. The governments of the Indian subcontinent wish to make it clear at this time that any action on their part is quite out of the question, and they wish to disclaim any and all responsibility. So back to the beginning. Yes, I'm afraid you're right, the president agrees. A fine way to run a country. Isn't there a government on the face of the earth that's willing to be responsible for anything these days? Well, what if the admiral is wrong? Couldn't we still try to work something out? Something official, I mean, through diplomatic channels, maybe the United Nations. The undersecretary springs to his feet like a jack-in-the-box, beside himself with glee. Listen, I have a perfect idea. We put this fleet of nomads under the UN, blue flag and all, with sailors from Sweden, Ethiopia, and Paraguay to act as observers. Then we let their relief agency send out helicopters once in a while to feed the people and take care of the ships, and the fleet goes round and round from ocean to ocean all over the world for the next 20 years. That should satisfy everybody. Besides, it's hardly a new idea. Remember Palestine? Just one thing. In 20 years, there'll be twice as many on board as there are today. What with the heat and nothing to do, we'll have to build a floating camps and attach them to the fleet. Believe me, gentlemen, it could go on like that for a long, long time. In two generations, they won't even know why there's nothing out there but ocean, as far as they can see, or why the deck of a ship is their only homeland. That's right, their homeland. Because in time, they'll even come to feel a kind of national pride. The heat, after all, and nothing else to do. Then they'll ask for independence. They'll damn well demand it, and why not? The UN has delegates today from a hundred countries that have no excuse for existing. We'll invent a hundred and first, that's all. The floating republic of the high seas, we'll call it. Naturally, there'll have to be a partition, the way there always is. We'll split the fleet in two and make sure both halves turn in opposite directions. That way, they'll never have to meet. Of course, it's going to cost us something. The West will have to be done, that is, build, for the upkeep. 
The richer we are, the more jealous they'll be, and the more we'll be billed. But so what? We're used to all that. Don't we do the same thing now when the third world kicks up and we want to make peace? We pay. We bitch a little, but we pay. And we get our peace for a couple of food packages from the UN relief and some aspirin from World Health. Cheap enough, don't you think? Isn't that what you want? A nice, quiet, lasting little peace and one that won't cost us too much or worry our neighbors? He turned to the president. There's my idea, Your Excellency. It's yours for the asking. The president flashed him a quizzical scowl. What's your background, Monsieur Perret? Marginal majority? No, I mean, what school? École Normale Supérieure, degree in letters? I could have guessed. You're joking, I hope. A look of disapproval furrowed every brow, frozen in a painful mask of fruitless thought. Gentlemen, the president went on, you're worse than a bunch of tongue-tied schoolboys flunking their orals. Whereas you, Monsieur Perret, a smile passed between them. Yes, Your Excellency? You're right, I'm joking. Still, I seem to be the only one here who sees what an absolute farce this whole business is. To threaten the West with a bloodless invasion? Indeed, did you ever see the lamb attack the wolf and gobble it down? A flurry of portfolios and cries of shame, shame, no heart, no soul. Yes, when the mind is missing, a soul will do. Your Excellency, he continued, when my colleagues decide to discuss the subject rationally, and what a great dig that is against the religious, when the mind is missing, a soul will do. When my colleagues decide to discuss the subject rationally, I'll be only too happy to suggest 20 serious ways of solving this ludicrous problem. For example, the president queried, the undersecretary sat up straight, pointed his hands to a child with a make-believe gun, swept them in an arc around the table. Bang, 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 bang. You're all dead, he shouted. A wave of shocked dismay ran through the room. As it reached its height, the admirable, half hidden behind the minister's chair, went boom, boom, boom. What's that? the minister blurted, wheeling around eyes aglare. The cannon, the admiral replied. Three ministers were sitting, heads in hands. Another was mopping his brow. Two more were choking back anger, while three were trying to stir theirs up. One of them even sat there weeping, discreet and worthy tears. It was he, in fact, who finally broke the siege of silence as he slowly raised his head and gazed at the council through disheveled locks with the tragic mask of a grand vizier. Are we the government of France, assembled in extraordinary session with His Excellency, the President of the Republic, to discuss humanely a drama that has no precedent since deep in the Middle Ages, a drama that shows the way to man's loftiest transformation as he stands at last at this hour of materialism's ultimate upheaval? Or are we some petty village council, called by the mayor to tighten a ban against gypsies camping on our public lands? The speaker was Jean Aurel. The president, rather sheepish, felt obliged to soften his attack. Aha, my thoughts exactly, he said. My very words to the council last year during the general strike. Gentlemen, are we the government of France? And later, too, when we had to devalue the franc. Satisfied with his defense, he added, Please, Monsieur Aurel, continue. Whereupon the wind of the past rose up from across the ages, gathering all the derelict fleets, the prophetic peoples, the militant armies, the nations drunk on trumpets and drums, the kingdoms of God, and sweeping them off toward the calm and fathomless deeps, where even the boldest of storms will blow themselves out in the end. Its great historic gust pushed back the slumping shoulders, raised up the bowed heads circling the Elysian table, and turned all eyes toward the vast perspective of humanity, unbounded. Proof once again that when the mind is minute and the heart misplaced, we have to invent a soul to answer for all our foul transgressions. Off in his corner, the undersecretary sat smirking to himself. No one gave him a second thought, except the president, perhaps, in his own bizarre way. The spirit of France, her particular genius, Minister Jean Aurel went on, has always guided her path through the great waves of modern thought, like the noble flagship whose instinct shows her the way to go, as she plies resolutely forward, colors flying for all to see, at the head of the fleet of enlightened nations, 
setting their course, now left, now right, showing them how to sail into the storms spawned by the great compassionate gales of human progress. And so the thinking machine wind on, guaranteed authentic, 100% Orel, last word in modern technology with chrome-plated psyche, plastic-coated, rust-proof, anti-doubt brain, and prefab heart clicking its clockwork claptrap a mile a minute, available on easy budget terms, perfected model for high-class personnel and special reinforced model, ultra-deluxe for millionaires, social lions, and potentates of the press. Can we get to the point? The president mumbled, discreetly winking at the stenotypist to keep the remark off the record. <clears throat> the point was finally reached a quarter of an hour later, but only after a stratospheric flight beginning at feudalism's dying gasp through the declaration of the rights of man, the abolition of slavery, universal suffrage, state-run education, the anti-fascist gains of 36, the liberation of Paris, the liberation of Algiers, third world relief, and French-style socialism. Gentlemen said the minister, what difference does it make if this fleet, heading west, inching its way through our conscience with its last ounce of strength, like a dying indictment, lands on the shores of France or Germany or England? What difference indeed? All the privileged nations must stand up as one, must lend one solemn ear to the eternal question. Cain, where is Abel, thy brother? What hast thou done? Can any among you fail to perceive that France owes it to herself to respond in a clear, compassionate voice and to plan a heartfelt wel welcome, here and now, in keeping with both our material wealth and our moral resources? At the moment of truth, how urgent it will be to know how to read the signs and symbols and master our own selfish interests. Ah, yes, what a lovely tune. How that breed puffs and struts when there's nothing to do but sing. These days, with its swelling cliché chorus, how expert it is in feigning concern without taking a stand, in basking in the trumpet's blare while marking time and place, in pouring out into the street to beat the drum for the revolution, yet never leaving the pavement hallowed with a single corpse for a single cause, in cherishing its heroic illusions bought for a song. In no time the Council of Ministers gave their approval. Plan A welcome? Why not? Plan a welcome? Why not? With the universe all eyes and ears, think how odd and impressive it would be. Isn't that rushing things a little, the president ventured to suggest? Spontaneity, replied the minister, is the mark of true generosity. France owes it to herself. Yes, echoed the president loud and clear. France owes it to herself. Then silence. But his thought marched on. France owes it to herself to speak the truth. No more, no less. When will she finally stop playing along with fate and decide to put her foot down? She'd find it so refreshing. And he gave a hint of a shrug with his shoulders, meant for himself. After all, wasn't he the first citizen of France? Up to his neck in the monster's slimy jaws? Playing both sides at once like all the rest? Anti-racist and racist, protester and patriot, Marxist and libertine, Democrat and fascist, communist and landlord, ecumenist and Catholic, unionized, socialized, subsidized, conservative, humanitarian and hedonist, rolled up into one? Yes, France owes it to herself, the president repeated, to present the world with a clear, coherent view of the whole event. For that reason, I'm authorizing Monsieur Aurel as a spokesman for the government to explain our position to the press and, taking into account the distant vantage point we still enjoy vis-à-vis -vis the refugee fleet and its uncertain future, and within the bounds of common sense, of course, to sketch out for them, in very broad terms, some kind of general welcome in a framework of international cooperation. I would hope to allow us, if need be, to share the burden of a generosity which, frankly, I fear we would come to regret, or could come to regret. In fact, if you want my thoughts on the matter, he caught himself raising both hands hip-high in what promised to be an eloquent gesture, then stopped in mid-air as if thought, thought better of it, and shook them from side to side in a mute negation, 
as if to say this probably wasn't the time to be giving his thoughts on the matter, all things considered. Off at his end of the table, the undersecretary wasn't taken in by the maneuver. He looked the president square in the eye and formed four short, silent words with his lips. Bang, 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 bang. Gentlemen, that will be all for today, the president said, standing up. Then he went to his office, gave orders not to be disturbed, poured himself a good strong whiskey, loosened his tie, unbuttoned his collar, turned on the giant television set, and settled in his everyday round-shouldered bulk deep into his armchair. Then, live and in color, Monsieur Jean Aurel, quote, end this chapter. Without meaning to exaggerate the seriousness of the situation, the minister began, placing a slim sheaf of documents in front of the microphones. The government of France perceives it as a sign of things to come, a symbol of the rising worldwide socialist movement. Suddenly the symbol has grazed the tip of its wing against our worn-out world, and the old world, whether afraid or proud, shudders at the touch. Gentlemen, in an effort to clarify our position in regard to this momentous decision, I have come here this evening to answer your question. Chapter 17 Monsieur Aurel, this is a quote, without jumping to conclusions as to their final destination, may I ask the government if the government has any plans to ease the plight of these poor, suffering souls? It's reaching a point where we can't sit idly by. The speaker was one Ben Swad, S-U-A. A.D., alias Clement Dio, one of the monster's most faithful minions, concoctor-in-chief of the poisonous slops poured piping hot each Monday into the feeble, comatose brains of the 600,000 readers of his weekly rag, served up in its fancy sauces. Citizen of France, North African by blood, with an elegant crop of kinky hair and swarthy skin, doubtless passed down from a certain black harem slave girl sold to a brothel for French officers in Rabat, I think that's in Algeria, as he learned from the bill of sale in his family papers, married to a Eurasian woman officially declared a Chinese and author of several best-selling novels, Dio possessed a belligerent intellect that thrived on springs of racial hatred barely below the surface, and far more intense than anyone imagined. He, in other words, he's, a, he's like a Bar Barack Obama type. Like a spider deep in the midst of the French public opinion, he had webbed it over so thick with fine gossamer strands that it scarcely clung to, to life. A cordial type all the same, given to great informative bursts if he chose, though always one way. Sincere enough to put his convictions on the line and draw the occasional fire of intelligent colleagues, of whom, whom there were fewer and fewer, alas, and whom people had all long since stopped reading, in those topsy-turvy days, the left sprawled out in abundance, while the rightest press, in a hopeless muddle, languished alone in its trenches, deserted. Again, this is 20, 25 years before the Internet goes mainstream. The home front, meanwhile, true to form, fraternized high and low, unabashed and unrestrained. Politically, Dio's columns were something of a harsh something of a hash, whipped up with a proper dose of utopian pap, but most dangerous of all was his very special talent, unrivaled in fact, for planting his minds through the deep waters of current French life, far and wide, just surface deep, always finding those areas still intact, and larding them through with the deadly devices, spewed mass-produced from his prolific brain. Jean Aurel, we should note, was one of his most devout readers, never missing the weekly pause in the journey along his aging imagination, and confiding to his intimates with a chuckle that this, that, quote, this Dio chap reminded him so of the fearless reformer he himself used to be. Lots, quote, lots of nerve, plenty of new ideas, and a real burning passion for the everyday man, the citizen of the world. Yes, this Dio chap, citizen of the world, in all his glory, ah, what a dismal, repulsive creature. The journalist's pen gave him many a size and shape, but one thing never changed his contempt for tradition, his scorn for Western man, per se, and above all, the patriotic Frenchman. Like a kind of anti-Joan of Arc, 
charged by King Dio with a thousandfold mission, to wit, to crush with the weight of shame and remorse the common, foot-slogging soldier of the Western world, lord of its ancient battles, deserted by all his generals to a man, but a powerful force all the same. In column after column, the anti-Joan became, by turns, an Arab workman, snubbed and insulted, a publisher of smut, hauled into court, a black bricklayer, exploited by his boss, a theater director with a censored play, a young Madonna from some leftist slum, a rioter beaten for ripping up the streets, a cafe tough shot in his tracks, a student terrorist, a schoolgirl on the pill, the head of a people's culture center, summarily fired, a marijuana prophet, a rebel leader dispensing guerrilla justice, a married priest, an adolescent lecher, an incestuous author, a guru of pop, a female dead from an overdose of love, a pummeled Egyptian, a poisoned Greek, a Spaniard gunned down, a reporter attacked and beaten, a protester crapping on the unknown soldier, a hunger striker soft in the head, a Vietnam deserter, a big chief thug from the wrong side of town, a faggot with medical excuse, a sadistic schoolboy tormenting his teacher, a rapist, mind twisted by racks of hardcore porn, a kidnapper, sure of his righteous cause, an incurable delinquent, victim of his genes or society's pressures, an abortionist butcher, screaming for his human rights, a Brazilian backwoods wench, sold into Sao Paulo salons, an Indian dying from a tourist's measles, a murderer calling for prison reform, a bishop spouting marks in his pastoral letters, a car thief mad for speed, a bank thief mad for publicity's easy life, a maidenhead thief mad for free and easy sex, a Bengali dead of starvation, and so many more. And that was impressive. So many crusading heroes, skillfully chosen, everything but the normal is exalted by this mixed blood, is what he's talking about, this metasage. So many crusading heroes, skillfully chosen to please and persuade, which they usually did. And why not? When the heart gives way, it's a Turkish bazaar. Freedom is all or nothing. With the likes of this would-be heart-rending rabble, these pseudo-pathetic peons beating his battering rams against the gates, Dio knew that, in time, he was sure to smash them down. When freedom expands to mean freedom of instinct and social destruction, then freedom is dead. And all the slimy Dio larvae teem on its corpse, ready to burst into great black moths, heralding angels of the under anti-world. Ready to burst worms on the corpse, ready to burst into great black moths, heralding angels of the anti-world. To appreciate the scope of Dio's power, we could look to a hundred examples, but one will suffice. The St. Favier, F-A-V-I-E-R, swimming pool scandal. St. Favier is a dull, sleepy town stuck away in the Jura, J-U-R-A, that decided one day to indulge its wild fancy and present itself with a gift sure to rouse an industrious populace lulled by the pipe maker's lathes, namely, a swimming pool. Olympic, Hilton-esque, covered in the winter, basking in mountain sun in the summer, a billionaire's pool on a communal scale, a fabulous toy for the people, democratic to a fault, and always jam-packed. God knows how those French love the water. Well, it just so happened that, in one of the weekly analyses required by law, a lab technician discovered a troop of bacteria, Ganococci to be precise, living on a corner of the metal plate marked saint Favier Municipal Swimming Pool, happy as could be with their new surroundings, and in a word, thriving. So well, in fact, that the hospital, much to the doctor's disbelief and indignation, found itself treating three youngsters with ophthalmic gonorrhea, that is, gonorrhea in the eyes, two girls and a boy not even related, and one of whom, it should be noted, was a pupil with the Sisters of Perpetual Help. Now in France, no school tot does anything much with her eyes, but open them wide, agog at the wonders of the world. There had to be an explanation. 
and it soon came to light in the files of the hospital, the National Health Plan, and the factory infirmary, where the records showed that a thousand Arabs, first-rate workers notwithstanding, and socially accepted if not socially absorbed, had been showing up time after time to the tune of some ten percent, with the aftermath of a stubborn case of North African clap. To be utterly fair and unbiased, the authorities proceeded to check through the files of all the Jura natives, too, a time-consuming task, but one which the West, personified there in saint Favier, felt obliged to perform in the worthy effort to subdue its prejudices. The result, unhappily, merely confirmed them. They turned up a total of two rich young brats, both terribly spoiled, who wouldn't have dreamed of using the public pool, and one dirty old derelict who never bathed and didn't know how to swim. What a blow for the poor town fathers! Such fine folk, too, these laborers, pensioners, railroaders, politicized peasants, placing their leftist ballots in the box, like Eucharists laid on the communion plate, and scratching their chins deep in thought. One of them, a delegate from the Communist Trade Union Party, in a highly emotional search through his papers, brought out a mimeograph document proving that the Arabs were essential to the economic well-being of the nation, and that the sudden resurgence of racism had to be nipped in the bud. Of course, they all agreed. The point was well taken. They were all for the worldwide solidarity of the masses. But still, if their kids' eyes were going to be catch the clap, after all, and in their nice new pool to boot, that they scrimped their pennies together to pay for, and a dose like you wouldn't pick up from some army camp whore, well, Arabs or not, they couldn't just let the thing get out of hand. Besides, doesn't everyone know it's an Arab disease? The fine folk believed it was only common sense to vote as they did and to reach their unanimous decision, namely that thereafter the only Arabs to use the municipal swimming pool at saint Favier would be those with a medical certificate proving that they had no contagious diseases that might be spread by water. The decree was posted at the entrance to the pool and in all the Arab cafes and haunts in town. It was, in fact, rather clumsily worded, but that's hardly a surprise. In times when a spade has ceased to be called a spade, it's no wonder that thirty-two town fathers, each one a family man, but none with an excess of schooling, should let themselves be trapped by the subtleties of language. Dio rubbed his hands with glee, and proceeded to use the saint Favier edict as his cover of the week, spread over the newsstands in all its glory, by ultra-capitalist distributors, no less, with a big title splashed across, proclaiming, quote, anti-Arab racism alive and well, unquote. 600,000 copies, rather hard to miss. In Paris, His Excellency, the Algerian ambassador, demanded an audience and got it on the spot. The North African press let loose volleys of hate, and the French press picked up the tune, albeit in a minor key. Somewhere there was even the observation that plenty of French women jumped into bed with these poor slandered Arabs without once insisting to see their bill of health. Retaliation took many forms. Oil, for example, was an issue again, as three tankers returned bone dry, and a hundred nice French girls, teaching school in Algeria, were suddenly hauled into the hospital and spread on the stirrups to be plumbed and explored by a squad of medical student commandos whipped up to a frenzy. Two of them died as a result, but the inquest didn't last. On his minister's orders, the prefect of the Jura quickly reversed the saint Favier decree, first for certain technical flaws, and also for its breach of human rights. Dio was exultant, crowing his triumph in one of his best editorials, because when all was said and done, he was right. And any time that man was right, which he often was, since he chose his pretext with diabolical skill, the walls of the ancient citadel were sure to crumble. So the Arabs of the saint Favier returned en masse to the pool victorious, and they had it all to themselves, no townsfolk were seen there again. There wasn't even talk about building another one separate from the first. What would be the sense? And all at once, whole sections of New York are deserted. A score of American cities watch the flight to the suburbs, and half the historic Paris pavement, too. American tops and tots in their integrated schools fall five years behind tubercular galls, flee in droves from our open-air clinics. Tally-ho, tally-ho, just listen to that battering ram smash at the southern gates. 
Now, here, in my opinion, is where he needs to be talking about the Jew, because the Arabs aren't owning these the media there. It's the Jews owning this. It's the Jews insisting on these rules that he just says he's talking about France, but he could just as well be talking about white flight in America. It's the Jews doing this, and this is something he never mentions, and he serves as a prophet, but this is the one thing where he would be seriously marked down for completely avoiding. And so, into the press room of the Elysee Palace, amid 500 reporters, all concerned more with rhetoric than truth, slipped the battering ram's most recent recruit, the starving passenger of the pathetic fleet. The question was very well put. Not the principal question, to be sure, no frontal attack that might frighten off the faint of heart, but a question that checked the big issues at the door and subtly aimed at the hidden, most vulnerable spot. Quote, dot, 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 may I, may I, <coughs> may I ask if the government has any plans to ease the plight of these poor, suffering souls? It's reached a point where we can't sit idly by. End quote. True, the West can't sit idly by anymore, not for anything. It had better get that fact through its skull, no matter how many induced neuroses it takes to sink in. Out of all the world's billions, let one Indian from the Andes croak from famine, or one black from Chad, or one Pakistani, all citizens, by the way, of free and independent states, proud of their self-determination, and suddenly the Western world feels obliged to fly into raptures of repentance. The agitators know its reactions. It's not even money that they're after. No, no appeal to the breast-beating West to thump on its wallets once and for all, and adopt the four-fifths of the globe trailing dimly in its wake. No, they aim for the head. Those remote lobes of the brain where remorse, self-reproach, and self-hate, pricked by thousands of barbs, come bursting out, spreading their leukemia cells through a once healthy body. It's reaching a point where we can't sit idly by. Of course not. Sit idly by? What a thought. The minister's voice was so choked, he could hardly speak. Gentlemen, we have to think in tune with worldwide conscience. Or perhaps the word should be throb, not think, since our hearts are at issue. I'm sure you agree, not our heads. The moment this fleet set sail, a million human beings chose to cut themselves off from their homeland. Far be it from us to pass judgment. Far better to think of these poor, homeless souls as citizens of the world, in search of their promised land. At first the government of France felt compelled to approach the governments of India in an effort to persuade them to hold back the fleet to keep it from plunging out into the deep. It will come as no surprise when we think of the wretched conditions that engulf that unhappy part of the earth to learn that our efforts were fruitless. What power, after all, can stem the force of fate? And so let me assure you, gentlemen, that the government of France, having once done its duty, is nonetheless ready and willing, indeed all the more so, to assume the humanitarian obligations incumbent upon all men of goodwill in these truly unprecedented times. France will take her place in the forefront, make no mistake. She asks only one thing, and we venture to say that her past actions give her the right to insist. That is, that she shall not stand alone. With that in mind, she has proposed to her Western partners that an international commission be formed for the purpose of providing the fleet with urgently needed food and supplies. Whatever qualms some of us may have about the outcome of an affair unparalleled in its desperation, we are duty-bound to keep them to ourselves, and to say for all to hear, These men are my brothers. Typical, the president said to himself. The old son of a bitch has to throw in a headline. Also in front of their color TV screens were most of the magnates of the French shipping industry, watching the press conference from their presidential suites. They were doing their job, nothing more, merely keeping abreast of whatever concerned the sea and whatever might hinder the speed of their ships and the profits they reaped. Their reactions against the general tide are well worth noting. First, consultation by phone among themselves. Then, coded messages buzzing from antennas, haughty and high atop their company roofs, to all their ships in the Indian Ocean. Quote, ordered to change direction, earliest convenience, avoid all possible contact with refugee fleet, present position assumed as follows. 
Of all the captains who received that command, not one failed to see that this forced retreat was a retreat of the conscience. Theirs was being protected, and they rushed to obey. Seafarers that they were, they knew the impossible and hopeless when they saw it. That one typhoon blast, that one typhoon blast these rotting wrecks with their million starving creatures strewn over the water, tangling in their tunics and waiting to die, and every last ship in the western world brought together by some kind of miracle, still couldn't save even the hundredth part. And at what a price to try! All useful commercial traffic halted. Crews stunned by the sight of an ocean of corpses. Fine merchant ships turned Samaritan craft, floating hospitals left to days on end of aimless drifting. And for what? For life? Not even. For death. Death seeping its way deep into the western marrow. In other countries, too, the same orders were sent. In England, Germany, Italy, and more. And from that day on, the refugee fleet had the sea to itself. Off in the horizon, no billows of smoke marked the presence of man, no beating heart. Such was the first response to the minister's exhortations. Kept secret for the sake of human dignity, it did little to alter the course of events. Monsieur Orel, asked another reporter, are we to understand that you plan to reimpose censorship? Really, Monsieur Macafer, aren't you embarrassed to sound so foolish? What on earth could make you ask such nonsense? The verbal jousting between these two is a common occurrence. It livened things up, and sometimes they even enjoyed it. But this time they seemed quite determined to loathe each other in earnest. In short, the moment of real confrontation that had to come sooner or later. Why, you said so yourself, Monsieur Aurel. We're duty-bound, as you put it, to keep ourselves, to keep to ourselves any qualms we might have about the outcome of this affair. Aren't you suggesting a kind of moral self-censorship, in fact, with all the clear consciences on one side, and on the other, and on the other, yours? Yes, we know, Monsieur Macafer. Well, don't worry. You can go on just as you have, writing anything you please. Good. That's exactly what I'll do, said the journalist. First thing in the morning. And I'll be sure to read you, too, Monsieur Macafer, the minister replied. I'm one of your most faithful readers. Of course, I have no choice. It's my job. But still, that should make you happy. After all, there aren't many of us left. An obsequious smile ran through the press room. Everyone knew about Mockefer's paper. They knew what a time it was having to keep its head above water, and most of them gloated to watch it struggle. A poor, eight-page daily with no pictures, practically no ads, badly printed, and even more badly sold, it owed its survival to the combined efforts of a few anonymous benefactors, no one of whom gave very much, but who, taken together, got the moribund rag through the end of each month, like the cavalry in any good western, galloping up in the nick of time to save the beleaguered forces. Each month, just as all hope seemed lost, the bugle would blare its salvation. No one ever knew that the president himself was one of these unknown troopers. So the president is propping up this assumably pro-French right-wing paper with anonymous donations at the end of the month, because in his heart he knows what's right, perhaps. Mockefer's paper was neither right nor left, nor even lukewarm middle of the road. It would lash out, often where least expected, tilting at the windmills of hackneyed opinion, rather dogmatically sometimes, to be sure, although Mockefer's followers always felt that he hit the mark. And he probably did, judging by the hatred he never failed to stir far out of proportion with his real importance. But the press takes great pride in its objectivity, no personal hate, just personal opinion, and so it pretended to treat Mockefer's paper like a kind of journalistic joke, the Punch and Judy show of the trade. When all of them had had their laugh in Mockefer's direction, no punch puppet he, this tall old man with the deep blue eyes, natally dressed, white close-cropped hair, white drooping mustache, the minister called the class to order, making it clear that their playtime was over. Well, I think that's enough of that, he announced. Monsieur Macafer, I assume that you didn't raise your hand to subject us to your petty quibbles. If you don't mind, please get to your question. Monsieur Aurel, Macafer began, let's suppose that the Western nations go along with the government's proposal and provide for the refugee fleet as long as it's off in mid-ocean. Can't you see that you'll simply be feeding your enemy, fattening up a million invaders? And if this fleet, 
His tone, deliberately businesslike at first, grew more and more accusatory and shut up the lingering laughs out of the last few fools should reach the coast of France and throw those million invaders out onto the beach, would the government have the courage to stand up against the very same hordes that its kindness had rescued? Now that's the real question, thought Dio, the left-wing Arab, who had tossed out the first only to provoke the second, and he knew that Makafer wouldn't fail him. But he also knew, when he launched the debate on a lofty, altruistic note, that any other point of view would be seen as revolting, or at least overruled on the spot. For when a man is convinced of his noble nature, he'll never so much as flirt with evil, which usually does him in, in the end, ripped apart by both sides, like Burden's ass, forced to choose between his water and his oats. Mon Dieu, Macafer, the minister replied, your question is revolting. Do you ask a drowned man where he was going and why, before you pull him out of the water? Do you throw him back in if, assuming the worst, he admits he was swimming to your private beach to break into your cottage? No, you pull him out and hand him over to the police, Makafer answered. With a million thieves pulled out of the water, how many police do you think you can muster? Monsieur Jean Orel, the writer, beat an orderly retreat as the minister and him came back to the fore. There's no reason to suppose, he said, that the fleet will come anywhere near the coast of France, or even near Europe, for that matter. But assuming the possibility of such a hypothesis, and since nothing on earth could give us the right to stand in the way, even if we conceivably could, the government has decided, as it says here in the communique, to work out, with its Western partners, some kind of appropriate welcome, in a framework of international cooperation, to allow us, should the need arise, to share the burden of our generosity. At five knots, Makafer argued, they could sail around Africa and still reach the coach of Provence in roughly a month and a half. That should give your commission just enough time to study such vital matters as when and where to meet and how to proceed. They won't be in any hurry, you can bet. They'll take their sweet time to see where the fleet is heading. Then each one will tiptoe out and leave the lucky winner to shift for himself. And what if we pick the right number? What then, Monsieur Orel? Believe me, our friends will be simply delighted to see us left with that crowd in our hands. Now, no, I repeat my question. You won't repeat anything, Monsieur Makafer. You don't have the floor. For God's sakes, a million immigrants! Makafer shouted over the rising commotion. Back in the twentieth row, unobtrusive, Clement Dio sat calmly by quite still except for the rhythmic clack of his heels on the floor, and in no time five hundred reporters sat stamping their feet. Well, let's be exact. There were at least seven abstainers with a total readership of 42,000. You don't have the floor anymore, Monsieur Makafer. Now don't force me to have you ejected. It would be the first time in a press conference, I assure you. Your attitude is intolerable wholly out of keeping with our goals, with our mission of humanity and mercy, the mission that the government of France has entrusted me to set forth here this evening. Drum roll, please, said the president to himself. I trust the gentlemen of the third world press will do France the honor of ignoring the comments so utterly at odds with the unanimous, unanimous views of her people that I am sure you'll be printing tomorrow in no uncertain terms. We're in for quite a match, Dia whispered to his aide. Gentlemen, pens in place, and let the one who beats his breast the loudest come out the winner. All at once the minister's voice dropped down a few notches, as if something were draining out of him, as if something were draining him of his faith, like the blood ebbing out of a wounded man. And indeed, something was. He was being drained dry to the sound of a word, a lovely word spoken just moments before, now echoing back in his brain, like water dripping dripping, constant, and tormenting. Provence. 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 Yes, there in Provence, nestled against a sweet-smelling hill, an old country farmhouse, transformed by the Nobel millions, Nobel Prize millions, into a touch of paradise, welcomed the minister summer after summer, and Christmas, and Easter, and Trinity Sunday. But when your name is Jean Arel, prophet of your time, hero of great revolutions past, 
friend of the fallen leaders, advisor to the worthies of this world, and when age is upon you, ready to rub the slate clean in the name of a well-earned rest, when the moment has come to stop dealing in great ideas and to loll in the shade of a hundred-year pine, don't you owe it to yourself to raise your head one last time, faithful to your image of yourself, that image so hazy and naive that you almost have to smile at the thought, but a smile mixed with tears at the emptiness of it all. The minister raised his head. Any more questions? He asked in a weary voice. And there were a few more, in fact, though none very important, since everything really had already been said. The only one to attract some attention came from a Gabonese reporter, anxious to learn what they planned to feed, quote, our brothers in the refugee fleet, since, Monjuro Aurel, the important thing isn't just giving, but knowing the right things to give. Someone at least had understood. Dio made sure that he had the last word. Monjuro Aurel, all other questions aside, do you think they have a chance? A chance? A chance, the minister explained. Can we ever be sure whether man has a chance? It was a clever dodge, and Dio picked it up past master that he was, quote, it's the last chance armada, dot, 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 good title. These are journalists, and that's how they think. They're looking for meat. They're looking for gold. It's, that's how I used to be when I did it. And you're, when you're talking to someone, you're interviewing, you're asking them a question, you're, you're listening for the nuggets you can use that will really uh, encapsulate it. Pronounced in a murmur, just loud enough to be heard, last chance armada. The expression struck home, repeated thousands and thousands of times. Can it be that its impact paralyzed the West? Is a last chance something to turn your back on? Perhaps that might be one explanation. He's already used that a half dozen times, and we're not a third of the way through the book. Well, that would, will conclude session number three for today. And... As always, you can find this at vnnforum.com and alexlender.com. You can follow me on Twitter if you like. I want to thank you for being with me today, and I'll be back with you as soon, as soon again for uh, session four real, real soon.